I miss my dad. I have thought this thought only a few dozen times over the past few weeks. It is a very conscious and analytical expression of an underlying emotion that is, however, constant. Something is missing. If I were to be dramatic about it, I might say, there is a Hubert Dreyfus-shaped void in the world. And that is a curious thing, for it takes some kind of context or shape to really be able to see an absence of something. You need to know how something was there in order to understand how it isn't. The absence of an elephant in this room doesn't bother you because there's no context for that here. It's not something we see, uh, usually, on campus. Elephants <laughs> rampaging through buildings. <clears throat> but the absence of Bert rankles us to varying degrees because we all know about the various positive qualities that he exhibited. Thinking, of course, of all the stories that we have heard and will continue to hear, uh, it is that sense of the outline, you could say. Was he kind? Yes. There's one outline. Was he intelligent? Yes. There's another. Uh, did he intensely identify with his green Carmen Ghia? Yes. <laughs> Maybe a thicker outline. You know, the mirage is starting to take shape. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I think we can all agree that regardless of whether we saw him as an imposing figure in the world of philosophy, as a friend, as family, or some combination of these, Professor Dreyfus was a teacher, directly and indirectly. He was someone who brought about in us some new way of being, or some new understanding. All of this stuff we know. So I would like to share with you some of my experiences of my dad, uh, in the hopes of bringing a bit more detail, focus, shimmer to that space that we all are aware of. I did not plan this with Mark, but the subject is stop signs. <laughs> uh, he was determined not to stop at several stop signs. Uh, while he was fairly law-abiding, and of course now we know I have to say fairly, I can't say certainly, well, he was fairly law-abiding uh, with, with regards to many stop signs. There were a select few that were clearly worse than non-existent. Not only would he not stop at them, he would, with few exceptions, instruct me not to stop at them. <laughs> and give me reasons as to why. This continued from a time before I could drive, well into periods of when I was driving him around. Uh, I'll try to explain some of the reasoning. For one of the signs close to my parents' home in the hills, the reasoning was simple. When he moved into the neighborhood, the sign had not been there. <laughs> therefore, did not apply to him. <laughs> Perhaps someday somebody can explain to me whether or not this is Heideggerian, Nietzschean, Kierkegaardian, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but we now have a new term. This was certainly probably Dreyfusian. Uh, another sign further down the hill was mostly ignored. His reasoning here was not quite as interesting as it seems a fairly common way to feel about stop signs. I don't really want to slow down at this point in my drive to work. <laughs> it was at the bottom of a hill. He tends to gain speed while going down hills. Uh, as much as he doesn't like to use rules, he doesn't like to use brakes going down hills. <laughs> so, uh, I could understand that one, but I didn't understand why that reasoning didn't apply equally to all stop signs, uh, or perhaps even stop lights. He eventually learned to stop at the second one of the two, since over time he received at least three moving violations, not going to a complete stop. I do wonder sometimes if this police-based teaching method would have ever gotten him to stop at the impertinent latecomer sign. I hope not. Uh, other interesting stories related to uh, misbehavior while in the Karmagia. If you recall, the Karmagia is actually a rather svelte vehicle. It's not as wide as many cars these days. And there was a time where you could go from behind the police station, oh, wait, no, back there, the police station, uh, right into Sprout Plaza. And for some reason, I don't understand how the thing was laid out in the past, there were a few times where my dad would use Sproul Plaza as a means to get to bank robs more expeditiously. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm surprised that this next, uh, I'll have to explain a little bit in a second, but apparently 
one time, a police officer did stop him while he was driving through Spiral Plaza. <laughs> my mom happened to be in the car. And this is interesting, because normally my mom is the opposite of Bert in that rules are inviolable. inviolable. You don't want to break rules around my mom. It's a very bad idea. And yet, somehow, somehow, uh, my mom let him drive the Sprawl Plaza, and it's good that she was there, because when the police officer pulled them over, I don't know if there was some quick switch or something, but apparently, the way that he got out of it was by convincing the police officer that, that it was this French woman's fault. <laughs> that she didn't understand the rules and couldn't speak English, so you just have to let us go. <laughs> I may, I mean, I wasn't there for that story, it was reported to me, so you, I may have gotten it wrong, and uh, someone may correct me later, but I, that's how I remember the story, and either, anyway, it's much, much more fun that way. Um, there's uh, some other interesting things, not about necessarily breaking rules, or maybe it was back in the day. I distinctly remember in the age of Star Trek, when it was still going quite well on television, at one point my dad turned to me and said, you are going to be having half-alien babies. <laughs> and I thought, okay. Uh, and I was actually kind of excited about it. Uh, when I was very small, I had wanted to grow up to be a turtle. That's not the important part. But after that, once I got over that, I wanted to grow up to be an astronaut. So the idea of traveling in space and meeting interesting beings, hopefully not getting into fistfights with them, but you know, just being out there, meeting different types of intelligent life, was interesting, and so his suggestion that there would be half a million babies was not completely foreign to me. Um, however, 2001 eventually rolled around, there was no giant space wheel, there were no aliens, and so my dad revised his desire for half alien babies, and it switched to half Asian babies, <laughs> which, which it turns out is actually happening. <laughs> Although there was a bit of a scare for him before that was uh, happening, I, I took up Tibetan Buddhism and was pretty convinced I wanted to be a monk for a while, and he was getting very despondent about the whole baby situation. I don't know if Gabrielle's going to mention any reasons why on her end that would cause him despondency. We'll see. Uh, but uh, there finally came a day where after I'd asked my teacher three times to let me be a monk, I met somebody who uh, is Chinese. Or, She's from Manhattan, but she's definitely Chinese. Um, yeah, and that seemed to solve the problem. He was very, very excited about that. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is that it was very interesting for us to see that one of the last things that he clearly understood, or let's say the two, two last things that we were able to see that he clearly understood, one of them was really quite amazing. Uh, he understood he was dying of cancer. And he was able to express that clearly. It's one of the very last things he expressed. And, it, and as, um, as Mark intimated, it was not something that he was expressing with anxiety at all. It was, a, it was just a fact. That was how things were happening. And then after that, he said, and I know I'm having a granddaughter. And that, that was very, that was very uh, good for me to hear. Uh, and so it's, uh, it was lovely to know that despite that outer appearance of dementia, there was some very core dad still there. Uh, that core dad, for me, was one of the most extraordinary teachers of patience and unconditional love. Uh, it seemed to know almost no bounds. The only time that I remember him being really, like, face-changing, voice-changing, angry at me, was a time where I had been tickling him, and he said, stop, and I did it again. And then he said, he got very upset, stop it, don't do it. And that was the only time. Was the only time. <laughs> uh, which is interesting if you compare it to the other antics that I pulled on my poor parents. Uh, you know, I can't, depression is not an antic, but certainly it is something that is very, very difficult for parents. My depression didn't make him mad. Uh, my depression didn't make him lose patience with me. Um, uh, when, um, 
you know, my, I was pretty shiftless for a while. You can ask other people who know me. My sister was once sent to Los Angeles to see if there was anything salvageable there. Uh, and uh, it also, uh, while I was going through college, I, uh, I was experimenting with being goth, and there were some very aesthetically disastrous things that happened at that time, and even that didn't seem to disturb him. Uh, so, it didn't, uh, yeah, the, the depression, the shiftlessness, the gothness, those things contributed to me, okay, maybe not the gothness, contributed to me failing out of UC Santa Cruz, at which he did not get angry at me. He didn't lose his patience with me. Uh, he was not overjoyed, uh, but his love for me as a person and as a human being who could communicate made him want to communicate about the situation, rather than judge me or simply give up on me. Even though I had wasted his time and his money confusing him with emotions he could not understand, because you have to remember, and you've heard now some examples of this, the man was living in a blissful world where, uh, if, and if any of you read, read his book, you know, for him, most things were shining. And I mean, maybe we could say all things were shining for him, actually. Uh, he just wanted to find ways to encourage me to be happy. Um, wonderfully, he did not offer me terrible advice in the vein of try to be happy or get over it. These are, if you ever, ever meet anybody who's sad, and don't do that, don't do that, it doesn't work. Um, rather, he approached my life with inquisitiveness. He wanted to find, he, he, he wanted to try to understand what I was experiencing. Uh, those of you who've been to his lectures, and of course now we've heard about it, you can recall that this was his approach to just about anything new or foreign to him. Uh, he wanted to understand it. At some level, I knew because of his great desire to know more about my experience, I was loved by him. That The, the fact that he was constantly trying to understand what I was going through uh, was proof enough. And it occurs to me that we have lost an avatar of a very special form of love. A man with a love of understanding, perhaps indirectly truth, all for the sake of delighting and sharing and the seeking of it with others, so that they may flourish. If you were interested in interesting things and could explore them with him, he loved you for it. It wasn't until years later that I was able to piece all of this together in a way that mattered to my mind. Uh, but I'm grateful that I did, eventually and that it was in time enough to spend many years with him loving him back. Oh, no, there was more. <laughs> uh, he was um, the best teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. Well, what do I mean? Well, he, he has, you have to imagine the situation. Uh, your father is world-renowned for teaching some esoteric thing called philosophy. Your sister has gathered uncountable degrees in the material sciences. Your mom is a crypto-Catholic. And, you know, and then you decide to take up Tibetan Buddhism. You disappear, you come back, and you've gathered this new thing. Even though, years ago, you swore loudly and directly in front of that professor that you were never going to be a philosopher, here you go, picking up Eastern philosophies. Then you show up at home, you've driven, you know, at unreasonable speeds, five and a half hours, Los Angeles to Berkeley, taking a break from your job in Los Angeles where I was working on The Bachelor for seven years, and your dad learns about this strange turn of events in your life, and instead of getting upset, he appears to be filled with glee. It might be a trap. No, it was not a trap. Uh, there was no dressing down, there was no rout, there was no intellectual devastation. He was genuinely happy to see that I could not stay away from philosophy. <laughs> Even better, it was not his brand of philosophy, and now he could learn something. His questions were relentless. His intelligence, the demand for rigor, made me understand my own views with greater, greater clarity. Every debate we had made me better at understanding and explaining some of the very strange ideas I had been gathering. It was fantastic. I never did convert to academic philosophy and he is certainly not a Buddhist. In fact, one of the final statements I got from him before going into a very long silent retreat was, it's so sad, but you're completely wrong. <laughs> Despite this, he did not stop 
me from going on retreat. He did not stop loving me. As mentioned, his love was unconditional. <coughs> I learned much more than I could have if I had been left alone in a room full of my already Buddhist friends. Here is one final bright note for you to add to the space you define in your world as where Bert used to be. On multiple occasions in my youth, as we drove in the common Ghia to his office, blasting down Centennial Drive, again trying to avoid use of brakes, <laughs> he would inevitably drive past the Greek theater. He would sometimes say to me that he was disappointed that one of his youthful dreams had never come true. He had dreamed upon his arrival at Berkeley in his first glimpse of, the Greek, glimpse of the Greek theater that he would someday be lowered by helicopter into the theater where throngs of screaming philosophy groups <laughs> to hear his next presentation on being in time. So, <laughs> while this dream may never have come to pass, it pleases me to no end to imagine the world in which it did. <laughs> My dad is beyond the world now. He will continue to be in our private world. How he is there is completely up to us. Here we are, all the king's horses and all the king's men, but I know we know better. We do not seek to reconstitute Bert, to put it, all our pieces together in the hopes that he will live again. I believe we seek to purify our vision of him so that we can see clearly from the platform of the rest of our lives one of the amazing edifices that continues to live and augment us.